You can go ahead, I'll make it back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought I'd give him just a moment to digest your sermon there. <laughs> it was one. I don't know how many of you take the time when you get here on Sundays to open up your bulletin and see what's coming up. Look down through the program to see what songs we're going to be singing or who's doing the special music or who's preaching. At a previous church I served, I had a lay speaker filling in for me on a Sunday when I was away. And I was told that prior to the service, <laughs> he looked over and there was a lady looking down at her bulletin and she said, oh, the preacher's not going to be here today. And she picked up her coat and her pocketbook and she went home. <laughs> and it hurt his feelings. And I told him not to take it personally. <clears throat> Some of you look at the bulletin when you get here. A few of you may even take time to see what scripture is going to be read. Maybe, maybe even a few of you will get the Bible out of the pew and look the scripture up. You may have had a little trouble finding this one. I, when I emailed Jim about what scripture to read, I went ahead and I sent a copy of the scripture. It's not that I don't think Jim is smart enough to eventually find Zephaniah in his Bible, but I thought I would save him the trouble of having to go to the index and look down through all those names of the Old Testament books. Let's be honest. If, if all the writers of all the books of the Bible were gathered in one place, and we all had our Bibles with us, and we were, we were going around the room with a Sharpie, getting them to sign their book. Well, there would be a long line at Luke's table, and at John's table, and at Mark's table, and Paul's table, and Moses' table, and Isaiah's table, and Jeremiah's table, and David's table. There'd be a long line. Would you sign my Bible? Would you sign my Bible? What you wrote has, has meant so much to me, I just can't tell you how much. And over in the corner would sit Zephaniah all alone, <laughs> looking down at his iPhone, playing words with friends. <laughs> and if most of us noticed him at all, we would think he's there to put the tables away once the event was over. Even Zephaniah's name doesn't do much to raise his profile. The name Zephaniah literally means God has hidden. God has concealed. God lies in wait. <coughs> Zephaniah is Mr. Cellophane, if you ever saw the musical Chicago. It reminds me of a, of a sad <coughs> personal story. There are very few photos of me as a baby. I was the second child. I don't know what my parents were doing. I guess my sister must have broken the camera. My dad has said about me, he was so quiet we forgot we had him around until he was about five years old. Some of you may be wondering why with less than two weeks before Christmas, we're not talking about shepherds in the field and angel choirs and Mary riding pregnant on a donkey toward that little town of Bethlehem and Joseph worried about a pregnant fiance and paying taxes and finding a motel room. After all, much of the world has had the baby in the manger since right after Halloween, right? All I can say is hold on. We're not there yet. Zephaniah comes up in the lectionary of scripture readings for this Sunday before the Sunday before Christmas. Zephaniah is what has been called a minor prophet in the Old Testament. Minor in that his writings are shorter than say one of the major prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah. But not minor in terms of message. Zephaniah said what he had to say at a time when the world was in a mess. His writing speaks to an environment 
of confused values on the part of a people who, wandering aimless, are gripped by fear. Anything in that sound vaguely familiar? Zephaniah is a short book, just three chapters. What Jim read for us is the end of the third chapter. Sometime today, find a Bible and read the first two chapters and the first part of the third. But let me warn you, if you're looking for a picker-upper, if you're wanting Norman Vincent Peale, power of positive thinking, this is not the book for you. <laughs> Zephaniah was writing during a period when the people of God had lost their way and had been drawn to adopt the world's ways of handling life's challenges and problems instead of God's way. It has been said about Zephaniah and the times in which he wrote, the prophet spoke boldly against the religious and moral corruption when in view of the idolatry which had penetrated even into the sanctuary, he warned that God would destroy out of this place the remnant of Baal, a foreign god, and the names of the priests who had perverted the faith. The whole of the Bible is an ongoing story of a people who were once no people and whom God has made into a people. You remember after the initial stories of creation and then the flood, the Bible zeroes in on one man, Abraham, whom God has called to leave where he was and lead a movement to a new place, a promised land where a people would be formed that would, that would be a light to all peoples around the world. In other words... At the heart of the Judeo-Christian story is this notion that God's people would be a beacon of hope living in the world as if God is in control. Now the Bible writers are painfully honest in their telling of how things are going in the development of that people. The Bible writers do not candy coat. Zephaniah is one of the bluntly honest truth tellers as he calls out to God's people, his people, the error of their ways. It was so hard back then and still is hard today to hold to God's ways when it seems like those who adopt the world's ways have the upper hand. As people of God, we are in a battle of sorts in these contemporary times. And the biggest problem we have is properly identifying the enemy. That has certainly been the lesson of history. We sometimes tragically have misidentified the enemy. We quickly forget the painful errors of our past. We forget that at the core of our identity is our calling to be a light to the nations, a beacon of hope, living in the world as if God is in control. Now it takes, it takes chutzpah. You know that word? It takes a certain part of the anatomy to live as if God is in control. It takes courage. It takes a willingness to paddle upstream sometimes, to go against the tide, to refuse to jump on the bandwagon of popular opinion or ride the wave of instant feel-good reaction. Sometimes to live as if God is in control requires going against the grain, defying what seems to be the natural response. We rarely think of it in these terms, but to be a faithful Christian sometimes means being defiant. Defiant. Now, some of you know a little something about being defiant. <laughs> you could teach the class. In fact, there's always a danger as a speaker to, to stand before an audience that might include folks who know more about what you're talking about than you do. Some of you have gotten a degree from the School of Street Smarts 
and you majored in defiance. <laughs> Maybe it started early in life. As I told you before, I spent part of my career in the field of mental health counseling. I was not trained in psychology per se. I, I had one course in college, so, so I had to learn things on the job like like the DSM, which is a manual for diagnosing psychiatric disorders. Included in the many diagnoses of mental disorders is, is a disorder called ODD. Do you know it? Oppositional Defiant Disorder. It's used primarily with adolescents. The symptoms of it are a pattern of neg negativistic, hostile, and defiant behavior lasting at least six months, during which four or more of the following are present. Often loses temper, often argues with adults, often actively defies or refuses to comply with adult requests, often deliberately annoys people, often blames others for his or her mistakes or misbehavior, often is touchy or easily annoyed by others, often is angry and resentful, often is spiteful or vindictive. Well, that's described about 95% of the teenagers in America. <laughs> On the scale of defiant and compliant, where do you stand? The older I get, and the more I gain understanding of my own peculiar ways, I'll admit, on the surface, I may look like I'm hyper-compliant. But my wife will tell you, <laughs> she has figured me out. <laughs> That's one of the dangers of marriage, you know. <laughs> She has figured out that while I might smile and nod and seem to be going along, I'm going to, in the end, do as I well please. <laughs> That's what she says, pleasantly defiant. That can be a little aggravating to live with. Zephaniah challenges God's people to defy, defy the trends and the impulses toward adopting the ways of the world and instead follow God's way. To be a light to all people and a beacon of hope, living as if God is in control. It was a bold and some might say unreasonable challenge given their circumstances. <laughs> They were a people who had been terrorized and victimized by foreign enemies. There were threats all around them. They had every right and every reason to be afraid and to follow the voices of fear mongers. They had lost a sense of home and with it the security of all that word is supposed to offer. Zephaniah points out to them though that most of their circumstances they had brought upon themselves. They had been major contributors to their own precarious situation. And they didn't want to hear that, God's people. You know, we think it's so much easier if we can blame somebody else for our troubles, right? Well, we can fix this problem if we can just get rid of those people and keep away from those people. That was what drove good people of good intentions, including a majority of Christians, seven decades ago in the country of Germany to give a second listen to a politician who told them that the reason their lives were so miserable was the fault of those people and the fault of weak leaders who refused to do anything about those people. Folks were afraid. And this politician spoke to their fears. So let's get those people out of our neighborhoods, or out of our cities, or out of our states, or out of our country. Now in that place and time, the religious test that was given for exclusion was first the Jews. The Jews are the problem, he said. 
Let's round them all up. And nobody said anything. Well, it didn't stop there. Next, he said, the homosexuals are the problem. Let's round them all up and get rid of them. And nobody said anything. And next, he said, the disabled are the problem. They're takers. They're not makers. They don't do anybody any good. Let's round them up and get rid of them. And nobody said anything. But then a few folks did start speaking up. And that politician said, anyone who expresses an opinion different from mine is a problem. Let's round them up and get rid of them. And the world lost great Christian prophetic voices for justice and sanity like Dietrich Bonhoeffer because he had the courage and decided to be defiant to Adolf Hitler's worldly ways. And the world lost millions and millions of God's children because the people of God remained silent. We are in a battle for the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus the Prince of Peace, the great champion of the lost and the lonely and the poor and the widows and the orphans and the refugees. We may have thought that we knew what it means to be a follower of Jesus, but we are in times when there are very different understandings of our identity as Christ followers. There is a growing and well-supported part of the self-proclaimed Christian world that believe in order to take down external enemies of Christ, we simply must fight fire with fire and we must adopt the ways of the world. And so this past week, at an assembly of young Christians at what claims to be a Christian institution of higher learning, the president of that institution said the answer to the violence of the world is for good people, good Christian people, to carry their concealed weapons in order to kill Muslims before they walk into the room. That was Jerry Falwell Jr.'s instructions to students at Liberty University, Roanoke, Virginia. Now, it's not hard to understand that reaction and the applause that that reaction drew from the audience to which he spoke. For fear is easy. It's easy to see and hear and smell. You don't have to conduct a study or do any research or take a class to know what fear feels like. You don't have to go against the tide or push back any natural responses to follow the lead of fear. For fear is built into our animal nature. Fight or flight. According to scientists who study human behaviors, that is how we were wired to respond. Fight or flight. Nothing inherently wrong with it. It's a survival instinct. And in an emergency, we perhaps need that instinct. The question comes, though, is that the way to structure one's life? directed by fear. On Thursday a week ago, San Bernardino, California, a young couple, parents to a six-month-old, walked into a room filled with people at a holiday gathering, a room which included people who just a few months earlier, had had a baby shower for them. They walked into that room armed like a SWAT team. And well, unless you have been living under